Good afternoon, and, and thank you for, for coming to listen. And thank you very much to Bank Inter and to the Foundation for inviting me to speak. I am afraid I probably will not cheer you up. Um, it is always perhaps as well to warn people of these things. I think in the current crisis that we face, there is both a threat and a potential benefit of innovation. As I go through the presentation, I hope to show that in some cases we're perhaps seeing too much innovation, uh, particularly on Wall Street. That despite rumors that the, the US investment banks are dead, that their business model is broken, I hope to show that they're actually expanding again and in fact creating problems for policymakers. But also I hope to show that particularly in Europe, we need a great deal of innovation that we need to reinvent ourselves, and nowhere is that more true, I'm afraid, than in Spain. But to start the presentation, I thought it would be useful to look at where the crisis began, how a problem with mathematics in some arcane mathematical models practiced in investment banks has some problems in mathematics brought the world into its current crisis. Uh, there may, of course, be some other problems as well. Here we go. Too much and too little. I start with a fairly, I suppose, dramatic chart, if anything in economics can be perhaps dramatic. It is the growth in liquidity in the U.S. financial system, or the growth in credit in the U.S. It's a very wide concept. It includes not just the commercial banks, but the investment banks, the hedge funds, the financial innovation that we've seen in the last generation. And you can see that the last 12 months, I'll give you the last 18 months, we saw a terrific collapse in the volume of credit available to companies, to households, to the private sector in general. Not just in the United States, but in Europe, in the United Kingdom, in even parts of Asia. Now why has that mattered? Not being able to borrow in theory should not cause this much difficulty. But in practice, why that credit crunch caused by the failure of the investment banks to understand the mathematics inherent in their models, that why that mattered was because at the end of 2007, or indeed through much of the middle part of the 2000s, private sectors around the world, in the United States, the United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and indeed Spain, were fundamentally cash flow negative. That the private sector of the Spanish economy was spending in 2007 about 110 percent of their incomes. A little bit more than the US, the ratio was about 106, a little bit more than the UK, about 105, not quite as much as Australia, 112, and some way short of the record holders, which are Iceland, who are managing to spend 135 percent of their incomes. Of course, things haven't worked out too well for Iceland. Now, when the credit crisis hit, people could no longer fund their financial deficits. They could no longer spend more than they were earning. And so we had to see a contraction in spending back down to the level of people's incomes. And that really is where the global recession has come from. That the inability of people to borrow has implied that they could spend, literally spend no more than they were earning. And so we've seen these stepwise adjustments in retail spending and consumer spending. Consumer spending falling 8% in the US in six months, doing that in three months in Ireland. Um, in all of these countries, it's because of this constraint of not being able to borrow to continue to spend more than we were earning, to continue to run a financial deficit. Now, of course, since the crisis hit, we've had politicians and policymakers attempting to solve it. And on several occasions, they seem to have promised that they have solved it. And for the next few moments, I'd like to look at what progress have they actually made. Well, with regard to the U.S. commercial banks, the city groups of this world, the Bank of Americas, they've actually made no progress. These institutions are still shrinking their balance sheets. 
They're not lending to people. A good friend of mine was appointed uh, to try and resolve the securities portfolio of one of the big U.S. banks. He was taken from one of the more famous hedge funds, parachuted into the bank, and told to sort out their securities portfolio. He took up his role in December last year. I, I saw him in March this year, and he bragged to me that he'd started off with a securities portfolio worth about $170 billion, and he'd managed to make it into a $40 billion portfolio without selling anything, simply by marking it to market, finding out what it was actually worth. And the losses that these institutions continue to face from their securities portfolios, and increasingly from their loan books, is implying that the bank's boards, the board of directors, won't sanction any asset growth, even when the banks have the capital available. So the U.S. commercial banking system is continuing to act as a very real constraint on U.S. consumers. And the same is true in many other countries around the world, as we will see. But where we have seen a big change, and, I, and perhaps you might suggest too much innovation over the recent months, is in this chart. I apologize, it's very difficult to see this chart. I, I had to steal it from the U.S. Treasury Department. They refuse to give you the data, but they will chart, so copy and paste. A line that you can't see, but I shall read to you. It's about Goldman Sachs. Now, in theory, the U.S. investment banks are shrinking their balance sheets. That's the big deleveraging story. Well, six months ago, Goldman Sachs had 7% of its capital exposed to the OTC, the over-the-counter derivatives markets. About four months ago, it was 4%. The last reading, 1,056%. What happened during the first quarter was that Goldman Sachs and the other remaining investment banks, and it's unfair to pick on Goldman Sachs, I only use them as an example because I have the data and they're particularly good at this. Goldman Sachs started borrowing from the Federal Reserve. And we can see from the data that the investment banks borrowed about $160 billion from the U.S. Central Bank, the Federal Reserve. And they used that to buy treasuries, which pleased uh, President Obama. Somebody funded his budget deficit. But the investment banks soon got tired of owning treasuries. They're quite boring. So they innovated. They took those treasuries took them back to the Federal Reserve and said, here's some collateral. Can we borrow some more money using this, these treasuries as collateral? So the Federal Reserve lent Goldman Sachs money to buy treasuries. Goldman Sachs then used the treasuries, took them back to the Federal Reserve and said, well, we've got treasuries to use as collateral. Can you lend us some more money? And actually, the Fed did. Lent them hundreds of billions of dollars. And the U.S. investment banks have been taking their treasuries back to the Federal Reserve borrowing from the Federal Reserve, and then using that money to buy more exotic instruments, in this case, over-the-counter derivatives, interest rate swaps, commodity um, exposure, currency swaps, but expanding their businesses there, including into credit default swaps, back into some of those structured finance instruments. And in fact, they put so much money to work in the derivative space that they created a mini bubble. And prices began to become very high in that space. And as prices became high, increasingly people realized that if you were a family office or an investor, or again one of these investment banks, who wanted to have exposure to corporate credits, and you'd been having that exposure in the derivatives markets, actually it started to pay to switch back into the cash markets. Slightly complicated mathematics, but instead of having maybe treasury bonds and a bit of CDS exposure, you could go back into the corporate bond market and pick up two or 300 basis points of yield. But the financial system, the financial engineering, some people might call it speculation process, started again very dramatically from about February onwards to the point that we're now seeing the investment banks and the hedge funds growing their balance sheets very rapidly. And a lot of that money has started to arrive into the corporate bond markets. And as the corporate bond markets have reflated, that's made it easier for companies to raise money. In Europe, the banks are not involved in such complicated things. But now that the European Central Bank is promising to keep interest rates low, the European banks have started to 
buy government bonds very aggressively, simply because the yield on the government bond is higher than the bank's cost of funds. If interest rates are going to be low for the foreseeable future, it makes sense for banks who may be short of capital, can only hold safe assets, to buy the ultimate in safe assets, government bonds. And so we've seen huge flows from the Eurozone banks into government bond markets. And that's actually funded all of the budget deficits that European countries have started to amass. And in some cases, the banks have bought more bonds than the governments have been selling. And if that's the case, as it is in parts of Europe and it also is in Japan, that means they're having to buy bonds from pension funds, from other investors. And those other investors receive cash, which they then need to deploy in some other market. And increasingly, that money is flowing into the corporate bond markets as well. So what we've seen in the United States and in Europe over the last few months is a dramatic revival in the corporate bond markets so that companies in Europe, in the US, can raise money fairly easily in the corporate bond markets. And that has, of course, made their life a lot easier. But what have they done with that money? Well, this is the US. Here's bond issuance in red. Here's equity buybacks in yellow. What US companies have been doing is selling bonds to raise money and then using that money to buy in their equity, perhaps because the equity is cheap, or more likely because the executives have a share option scheme. But that financial engineering, that speculative behavior, behavior that many people blame, myself included, for causing the financial crisis, is actually coming back in many parts of the financial system. And that's why equity markets have performed over the last three or four months. It's why, in some cases, the, the situation doesn't look quite so bad in the corporate sector. That we have a little bubble returning. And that sort of innovation is making Wall Street rich again. Why do many Wall Street banks want to leave the TARP and the other rescue packages that the US government has put in place? simply because the US government is trying to control how much people are paid if they're in one of those rescue packages. Well, now the investment banks can make money again. They want their $10, $50 million bonuses. So let's escape from the government, go back to our bad old ways. And this, I'd say, is the type of innovation that we really don't want to see. It's made us feel a bit richer. It's always nice when the stock market goes up. But the cost has been a deterioration in the long-term health of companies' balance sheets. Also, a few Wall Street investors can innovate a bit more and produce some more returns. And in fact, the Federal Reserve is not particularly happy about this. There are some positive benefits. If you're somewhere like Indonesia, the return of foreign capital associated with the recreation of this bubble in the financial markets is actually acting as a stimulus. It's true in Brazil, it's true in Korea, South Africa. Many of the emerging markets have seen capital flows coming back. That's put liquidity back into their financial system. In some cases, it's allowed the central banks to cut interest rates. And you are seeing some real economic effects from this. The same as in the United States and in Europe. The pickup in corporate bond issuance does have some positive benefits for the economy. And in some senses, this is a new transmission mechanism for monetary policy. The central banks have cut interest rates, they've created a lot of liquidity. Central banks have done nothing with it. But the investment banks have taken that money, created a little bubble, and there is some positive economic benefits for that. It is a stimulus for the emerging markets, which some people approve of. And this, in a way, is becoming a problem for the Federal Reserve and other central banks. You want this to occur. You want the banking system to take the generosity of the central banks and do something with it. Mobilize that capital into the emerging markets, into the corporate sector, so that you can stabilize the global economy. But the problem that the Federal Reserve and others have is they don't like the people they are dealing with. Six months ago, you wouldn't be on the New York mass transit system and say you worked for an investment bank unless you wanted to be mugged. These were the bad guys. Hollywood was making films in which international banks were the bad guys. It wasn't drug dealers or 
anybody else. It was bankers. Um, and now, six months later, having been rescued with public money, having caused pain and anguish for much of the global economy, the investment bankers are making millions again, expanding their balance sheets, recreating the bubble. And so what we're seeing is that the Federal Reserve and the European Central Bank have started to lend less money to the investment banks. They're saying, well, if you're just going to speculate with it, we'll have that money back. We're seeing much less lending by the Federal Reserve and the European Central Bank and even by the Bank of Japan to these investment banks. And just in the last few weeks, as the central banks have become less generous, I think the investment banks have begun to contract their balance sheets again. Unfortunately, the first thing they sold were U.S. Treasury bonds. And it's a bit of an uneasy relationship, I think. The Federal Reserve wants to see a stimulus to the economy. It wants to see low interest rates. It wants to see a bond market that can fund Obama's huge budget deficit. The U.S. government this year is going to issue something like $4 trillion worth of debt. At the moment, they're behind schedule. They need the investment banks to buy those treasuries. But at the same time, there's many people in Washington, and particularly the New York Federal Reserve, who are uneasy with the growth in the investment banks. They feel nervous about it. In fact, the governor of the New York Federal Reserve described derivatives as being the next weapons of mass destruction. And so the Fed in New York wants to slow down the growth in the investment banks. The Federal Reserve in Washington wants to put up with it because it's providing a stimulus to the economy. All that we know about that debate within the Federal Reserve is that on balance, the New York Fed is winning and that interest rates have been going up because the investment banks who were expanding their balance sheets all the way through here are now having to contract. They're selling treasuries at a time when the government is issuing a lot of bonds. That's driving interest rates up. And that, of course, is a problem for the real economy because this means that mortgage rates in the U.S. have already gone up by three-quarters of a percentage point, which at this point in the cycle is something you really don't want to happen. The corporate bond absolute interest rates, the actual interest rate that you pay is beginning to creep up. But these higher interest rates, because the Federal Reserve is being less generous to the investment banks, are going to start impacting the global economy. And for the rest of the presentation, I'd like to, say, I'd like to look at whether the economy is actually going to be strong enough to withstand this upward pressure on interest rates, or whether it will kill off what many people are calling the green shoots of recovery. What are these green shoots? Well, this is one of my favorite charts in the presentation. The red line shows what companies around the world think of their current economic situation, which is pretty unequivocal. The blue line is what people expect to happen. Now, Mankind is always optimistic, I guess. And certainly people are a lot more optimistic. But are they right to be optimistic? And I guess like economists, you can only be judged on your record. They became optimistic about four years before there was any improvement in the economy in the early 90s. They became optimistic about three years before there was any recovery in the economy in the early 2000s. So on that basis... They're predicting a recovery, I guess, in 2012. Which does suggest that this rise in interest rates could be quite painful. That if companies are really seeing the world down here, they don't need higher interest rates, that this is going to be painful. But there is talk of a recovery, and there have been some signs. If we look at somewhere like the United States, the level of new orders in manufacturing has appeared to pick up. There is some sign that companies in the U.S. are beginning to put some goods back into their warehouses. Is that a benefit? Well, in some senses, it's just a natural reaction to what happened in the first quarter. We have a little bit of inventory rebuilding. Who will benefit from that? Well, when the U.S. was destocking, when it was emptying its warehouses, the main people that lost were Asian producers. As the US companies attempted to empty their warehouses, they didn't really cut domestic production. What they did was cancel their import orders, particularly from Asia, 
So we saw countries like Taiwan seeing a 35% decline in industrial production in the first quarter. You may think Spain was bad, but it got so bad in Asia during the first quarter that the economists had to stop annualizing the data. When you start annualizing quarterly rates of 35%, you start wondering whether Taiwan will exist by Christmas. As the U.S. restocks, we can assume many of the goods they buy will be imports. And I think that's what we're seeing. But the big recovery in the manufacturing in, in Asia isn't about a new global upswing. What is really happening is that Asian inventories were very high relative to demand. So production collapsed relative to demand in red. The inventory problem has now been dealt with. Production is moving back up to be in level with demand. Yes, it's gone up over the last three months, and somewhere like Korea will probably produce 5% GDP growth in the second quarter. But then I think it will just go flat, and it'll still be down year on year. But Asia got caught by that collapse in U.S. demand. The Asian companies were holding too many inventories, so production had to drop below demand. Now production's coming back up to match demand. That's been the green shoots. It's just an inventory cycle, not actually consumer demand. And so the, this talk of a recovery we're seeing in the United States, in as much as there is some positive news, I think it happens for Korea or Singapore or Taiwan or Malaysia, Brazil and Mexico, is not really happening for the U.S. And that means, of course, that you won't be creating jobs in the United States. And if we look at employment intentions in the U.S., it's pretty difficult to see a recovery. All this chart tells you is that they're losing jobs each month at a slightly slower pace than last month, which, given they were losing close to a million jobs a month, isn't really particularly good news that they're only losing three-quarters of a million jobs a month. And they're losing income. Household incomes in the U.S. are now deflating. Even six months ago, people used to ask me, could the U.S. suffer deflation like Japan? Well, there is your answer. The U.S. is suffering deflation. U.S. workers are taking lower wages. They're taking benefit cuts. Mm. They may not want to, but they're willing to do so. They're working, for, they're working maybe for a day, a month, unpaid in some places. Some of the auto workers aren't getting paid for some of the work they do. But you are seeing how... Household incomes deflating. And that clearly is of some help to companies and that it should help to help to, to begin to rebuild profitability. But it, of course, is also a problem for the economy. Because U.S. households, rather like their Spanish counterparts and many others, have very high debt burdens. They have negative equity in their homes, that their home is worth less than the mortgage that's outstanding on that house. And they need to repay debt. And repaying debt just means they need to save. So instead of spending 106% of their incomes, they need to spend maybe 92% of their income. But their income is falling. So moving from spending 106 to spending 92% of your income when your income is falling means that actual spending could fall by a quarter. And so far in the US we've seen spending in dollar terms down by about 8-9% it clearly has a long way further to fall. And I think for the next two years, we will see that consumer spending continues to fall in dollar terms. That the deflation in the economy will continue. But if people are spending less, companies are receiving less. If they're receiving less, their incomes are depressed. Their profits are depressed. So they'll try and economize on their labor costs by cutting people's wages, which, of course, if people are saving, less money being spent, less profits, the economy can spiral downwards. And so I think it's much too soon to talk about a big recovery in the United States. We've had some good news over the last few months as the inventory cycle has corrected, but with demand falling, it's difficult to see any recovery in the U.S. in the next couple of years. And I think, really, U.S. balance sheets will be the first to regain their health in the global economy, but it won't be until 2011-2012. And of course, by then, 
the US government will need to raise taxes so they can repair its balance sheet, pushing out any recovery probably into 2014. Now what else do we have in the world? Are there any other bright spots? Well, the Japanese government has been quite remarkable. This is the worst economic crisis facing Japan for the last 50 years. Industrial production has gone back to the level it last occupied in 1983. And you'd think at that point, with unemployment rising, wages falling, and the economy collapsing, the Japanese government would spend some money and try and save, save Japan, have some sort of employment plan. Well, look, Japan has just achieved its first budget surplus in 25 years. They actually managed to raise taxes into this. But Japan's government has not taken any offsetting action. So while we may have a little bit of good news in the Japanese manufacturing sector, that inventories are down a little bit, but it is only a little bit, there's no fiscal offset. There's no stimulus from the government. Interest rates have been cut from half a percent to zero. In some senses, who really cares? If you were paying half percent interest rate or zero, it doesn't make that much difference. And so it's very difficult to see anything that's really going very right in Japan. In practice, it's an economy, I think, in deep trouble, where if the policymakers were to enact something sensible, maybe it could improve, but there simply is no sign because of the politics involved. And we're just seeing unemployment rising in Japan, the labor market deteriorating, wages falling, and of course that will just lead to a weaker and weaker domestic economy. The one thing that is happening is the Japanese banks, seeing all this deflation, are buying Japanese government bonds. And I think you know, if there's a, an asset allocation decision, then maybe Japanese, Japanese bonds are beginning to look attractive at these yields, given how many the Japanese banks are buying. But that is an overwhelmingly deflationary statement. The fact that I'm standing here saying that Japanese government bonds that yield about 1.8% look like a bargain really tells you how weak Japan's economy is. Now in Europe, is there any good news? Well, this chart in many senses I think represents the big secret that everybody knows but nobody talks about. And that is that the European banks in general are bankrupt. During 2005, and particularly late in 2006, the Eurozone banks were very aggressive buyers of US structured finance. So they turned up right at the end of the US boom and bought huge quantities, $2 trillion worth of CDOs and all the other alphabet soup rubbish that the US was producing at that time. So they arrived late at the party and got the worst wine. How much do they own? About three times their capital. Much of this stuff is trading at 20, 30 cents on the dollar. However, it is on the bank's balance sheets at 100 cents on the dollar or at par. The Eurozone banks are holding huge accumulated losses in US structured finance which they cannot sell because they cannot afford to take the losses. If they were to sell these assets, the banks would have to write down so much of their portfolios that they would be bankrupt in an instant. And so they have to maintain these positions. Now one of the problems they have is when they bought these positions in structured finance, they finance those transactions by borrowing at the short end of the US yield curve. They borrowed from US banks for three month, six month periods, and then bought 10 year structured finance instruments. It helped with the yield calculation at the time. But now they can't sell the structured finance. They need to borrow the money to, fight, to keep rolling over their positions. But of course, all the US money brokers will see a European bank turn up wanting to borrow $10 billion to finance its position and say, ha ha, how much interest would you like to pay? Three times everybody else or four times? So the US banks are making a little bit of money out of the European banks, but it costs the European banks a fortune. And so what we're seeing over the last six months is the European banks having to take euros, i.e. your euros, the ones that you deposit in, in, in European banks, 
convert them into dollars to finance these positions. And that's one reason I think it's going to be very difficult for the euro to, to, to rally. And why I think the euro could actually end up surprisingly weak by the end of this year and certainly into next year because of all the money the European banks will have to send to finance these positions which they can't afford to sell down. So I'm not a big believer in the dollar collapse. I think that the euro actually has some problems in the banking system, amongst others, that could make it a weaker currency. Now, technically, the European banks are claiming they're not bankrupt because they're not recording what this stuff is worth. In some senses, that doesn't matter because they're behaving as though they're bankrupt. This is bank lending in Europe. It used to be 700 billion euros a year. It's minus 30 over the last year. That European companies, European households can no longer borrow. The worst is Ireland, where credit is down 6 or 7%. I think Spain has just achieved debt deflation. Italy is not far off it. Greece is close. Um, Germany is already there. Many of the Eurozone countries, we're now seeing the volume of bank credit outstanding fall. And that means that if their exports are weak, which in most cases they are, and you have falling credit, there's really nothing to drive the economies. And people keep talking about green shoots in Europe. But look at the data. I only choose Belgium because it's sort of in the middle of Europe and there's trucks going across it all the time. So let's look at their leading indicator. It's difficult to see the recovery. Yes, there's an expectation of a recovery, but the actual data shows that Europe really isn't picking up, and I think it's very much too soon to talk about a cyclical recovery in Europe. The only way that you can therefore have a recovery is if you come up with something that people really want, that you must come up with the next iPod or the next clever idea. People are poor, they'll want to buy. And at the moment, there's very few signs of that. Cyclically, I see little to rescue Europe. And in fact, the situation will be getting worse. Although US companies were very quick to shed labor as the global economy slowed down, Europe was a bit later. We've seen capacity utilization in factories around Europe collapse. Employment is only just starting to come down. I think over the next six to nine months, we'll see unemployment leaping even further, even in Spain, where I guess the unemployment rate is heading for over 20%. In Italy, I think we could be heading at sort of 18% unemployment rates by, by the middle of next year. Really, rates that we haven't seen since the Great Depression, and clearly not a very cheerful outlook. And for Spain, Italy, to some extent Portugal, and most of all for Ireland, there's an extra dimension to the crisis. I'm afraid this blue line is unit labor costs in Spain. The red line is unit labor costs in Germany. Germany was expensive 10 years ago, but they've got cheaper through a mixture of productivity, through working longer hours, and essentially by not having any wage inflation for a decade. Spain has had some productivity growth, I think about one and a half, two percent a year, but obviously six or seven percent wage inflation on average, and that has damaged unit labor costs. And that is going to make it very difficult for Spain, I think, to grow. That the country is uncompetitive within the context of its Euro partners. It's worse in Ireland. I think Spanish unit labor costs may be 15, 20 percent too high. In Ireland, they're probably 30 percent too high. But the question is, what can you do about it? Ireland's decision has been to have wage deflation, to make people take pay cuts. And that's why about a third of the population were walking through Dublin protesting about the state of the economy a few months ago. Um, why the property market, it really is in free fall. In Italy, I think they'll attempt the same thing. They'll try to bring capacity utilization down in the economy, to create so many spare resources that ultimately wages go down, business costs go down, and the country regains some competitiveness. But is that a practical solution? Well, 10 years ago, and this may explain my, my optimistic view of life, I was living in Asia, and through the Asian boom and then through the Asian crisis. And one of my favorite phrases by the end of that was that democracies do not do deflation. 
We think about, la we think about Asia as having very flexible labor markets. But you can tell somebody in Hong Kong you're not paying them this month and they can't go to the trade union because there isn't one. They can't go to their contract because it's probably not binding or even worth the paper it's written on. But even in Asia, with their flexible labor markets, they could not do deflation. Not one government in Asia survived the Asian crisis. All of them were swept away. And many of them weren't even particularly democratic. Mr. Mahathir in Malaysia was a long way from being democratic. He was swept away. Suharto in Indonesia. Even Lee Kuan Yew's dynasty in Singapore was weakened. Thailand changed government several times, and the Koreans, I think, had a couple of presidents in the process. The only country, and it's not really a country, that didn't have a change in government was Hong Kong. But then again, I've never met anybody in Hong Kong that's voted in an election, so they perhaps don't count. Not one of the democracies or quasi-democracies in Asia could cope with deflation. Now, as we went into the Asian crisis, I reckon that Thailand's unit labor costs were 12% too high. So we're going to ask Italy, Spain, and most of all Ireland to have two or three times as much deflation in order to regain their competitiveness as Asia could not do in 1997 and 1998 because ultimately all that happened in Asia was they changed governments for governments that were prepared to devalue the currencies. And I do wonder whether the idea that is particularly popular in places like Frankfurt, that all that needs to happen is that the countries in the periphery need to deflate their unit labor costs, is just a dream that is probably more like a nightmare and something that simply can't come true in a modern democracy. Because democracies are incapable of living with government away, a new policy regime comes in. The Germans say they made sacrifices in the 1990s to regain their competitiveness. Look, they never really had deflation. It was a couple of percent right in the slump in 2001. It was nothing like the 20% deflation that we're talking about for Ireland and Italy and Spain. And I think that the only way the euro can survive without the political catastrophe that could follow deflation is one if the euro becomes an extremely weak currency. It goes back to 80 cents against the US dollar. Now if you say that in Germany they throw up their hands and get all excited because the euro can't possibly fall to 80 cents. They get a bit bored. It gets a bit strange when you then point out the last time there was a global recession the euro was 80 cents but that is another matter. But I think ultimately the only way that the peripheral countries can remain in the euro and the euro not become a very weak currency is if they can reinvent themselves. And that quite simply, countries like Spain have to justify their wage levels, not so much with improved productivity, because to be honest, if the SEAT factory can improve productivity, so can Volkswagen. It's going to be very difficult to gain relative productivity advantages on countries in the same currency union. But that these countries such as Spain must innovate. They must, in a sense, reinvent themselves to justify the current level of wages, to come up with the next iPod or the next big theme in the global economy. Because if those themes are not created, then this part of the world faces deflation. And as I say, deflation causes political change, ultimately causes currency regime change. And I think over the next few years, the euro faces a very, very tough test. Can the euro break apart? I don't say this as a sort of British non-member of the euro, but as an economist. Yes, currency regimes fall apart all the time. It happens quite frequently. Taking the euro out of circulation would be difficult. It would certainly be painful. It would involve closing the banks for a few, week, for a few days while, while a new currency was introduced. Now, normally, that, to most audiences, that sounds something rather strange. Although I was presenting this in Mexico, and they said, oh, sort of normal year then. Um, but you can change currencies. But I think for the next 18 months, there's very little chance of an economic recovery in the Eurozone. While places like Italy, Greece, and Spain are currently using fiscal policy, 
and employment plans to support the labor market. Remember, if Italy is still, or Spain are still sitting here with 5 or 6% wage inflation, when Germany has no wage inflation, they're becoming steadily less competitive. But the, the structural situation is becoming worse. And I think as we get into 2011, there'll be a real challenge for Spain and the other countries to remain in the euro unless they can come up with the next big idea, unless they really can innovate some solution that justifies their current wages relative to the rest of the Eurozone. Now moving quickly through the rest of the world, the Eastern Europeans, a lot of people I think believe the crisis is over there. In practice I think what happened at the G20 meeting was that the Eastern Europeans were given enough money to survive for another year. The, G the IMF became their bank manager and offered to lend them enough money to keep going. And so we're seeing places like Hungary, people are still borrowing. The IMF sends money to Hungary. Hungary, Hungarian banks lend it to Hungarians who spend money in the shops, avoid the deep recession for now, but one day they'll have to pay it back. The IMF is not going to keep money forever. So I think the Eastern European crisis will come back. It's only been, put a, it's been postponed a little while with some international money, but it's not something that, that has gone. And it'll come back again to make sure that it's difficult for the Eurozone economies to pick up, who of course trade with Eastern Europe. In the UK, I think doing something really rather different to the rest of the world. At an earlier part of the presentation, I mentioned that US households and others were starting to save, that they wanted to rebuild their balance sheets. And that's beginning to happen in most countries. It's slowly happening in Spain, not in the UK. This is the UK savings rate. Didn't like the idea of saving in the credit crunch. So we pumped a lot of public money into the banks. We've told the banks that they had to lend money to people. And people have seen the economy slow down and that's meant they should spend less, but they've decided to ignore that and actually spend more. So the UK economy actually looks quite strong, but at the expense of a further fall in the savings rate, a bigger financial deficit. The UK is probably the only economy in the world where people now have a bigger financial deficit than before the credit crisis. And just to make sure the economy grows, we're now running a 15% of GDP budget deficit. The only way I could explain what's going on in the UK is that it's as though on a Friday night or a Saturday night you went out and had a big party, drank too much beer or wine or whatever. And that's what the UK was doing in the 2000s, along with many other people. But while the rest of the world has woken up with a hangover and has vowed not to drink anymore, the UK has just gone back and found the nearest pub and decided to drink some more, which I guess in the short term will take the headache away, but probably results in liver failure in due course. But the UK, and perhaps some people might think appropriately, given their behaviour in assorted tourist towns around the world, um, are continuing to get drunk on credit. But next year, I think the government will have to raise taxes, the banks will have to stop lending money. And I think the real crisis or the real slowdown in the UK economy is not this year or last year, it's actually 2010 and 2011, when savings rates rise, taxes go up, and incomes start to fall. And I think the UK economy could shrink by 8 or 9% over 2010, 2011, making its worst economic slump easily since the 1920s and 30s. Now, China achieves a lot of positive headlines. Chinese production has certainly picked up. There is growth in China's economy. Why? Well, I think for a very simple reason. Over the last six months, the Chinese government has thrown $930 billion at Chinese companies and told them to produce more. There isn't actually any demand in China. Chinese retail sales are falling. Even in the construction sector, activity is falling. You see all of these headlines, and if, indeed if you fly into Shanghai or Beijing, you see all of this construction, they're building roads, bridges, airports, infrastructure everywhere, and that has caught the imagination of the world economy, and particularly the newspapers. But actually the slump in the residential housing market, in the private 
investment cycle is so big that construction activity is falling in aggregate, despite all that government spending. In the retail sector, as I say, demand is falling. So we have a rise in Chinese production, financed by all that money the Chinese government is giving companies. But nobody's buying it. And this to me is very much like a situation I encountered in Hungary just before the Berlin Wall was demolished. I did a research trip to Hungary. And of all things, we went to visit a company that made hypodermic needles. I don't know whether they were blunt or just the wrong size or what, but nobody ever bought this company's hypodermic needles. But they were installing a new production line exactly the same as the old one, and they were going to double production. Why? Because the government had told them that making things was good. And most of all, employing people was even better. Because I think China's government, at the end of last year, faced two problems. One, unemployment was rising, and therefore incomes were falling. But at the same time, China for the last 50 years, and some would argue for the last 100 years, has spectacularly failed to invest in its agricultural sector. Chinese food production peaked in 1999 and has been going down ever since. That productivity growth in the Chinese agricultural sector hasn't been above 2% in the last 30 years on an annual basis. So China was running out of food, food prices were going up, incomes were going down, and in China that's a short route to a revolution. Tiananmen Square was not about democracy and, and the various other things that were said. Food prices were going up, incomes were going down, people were unhappy about it. That, to me, I think was what really was going on at Tiananmen Square. And the Chinese authorities, particularly in this year, the 20th anniversary of Tiananmen Square, were nervous it could happen again. And losing power in China would not be a pleasant experience for the authorities. So they threw huge amounts of money at China's economy and told companies to produce more. And where has all that production gone? Into inventories. Chinese inventories are up massively. It's where all their GDP growth came from the first quarter. So when you see the CNBC or the CNN headline, China's economy grows 6%, actually, that was stuff being put in warehouses that nobody wants. And in fact, one Chinese official, I think, summed up the situation quite quite succinctly, he pointed out only two weeks ago that China was producing so many goods that were going into inventories at the moment that they were going to run out of space to keep everything soon. Whether it's iron ore from Australia, refrigerators, cars, television sets, washing machines, China has been, and particularly steel and, and the heavy end of the spectrum, China has been producing a lot but not selling it. And for now, that makes China's economy look great. And it makes a lot of Australians quite happy because they're sen selling iron ore and coal to, to, to China. But this clearly is not sustainable. Ultimately, China will have to dispose of those inventories. And when it does, it will end up cutting its prices. Now, China is already using export subsidies. But as those inventories pile up, and companies find them expensive, they'll want to dump them into overseas markets. So I suspect within a year, 18 months, you'll be able to buy a DVD player for a lot less than the DVD that you want to play on it. Because China will just be dumping these goods into supermarkets. The same in probably in cars. It's already happening in steel. And that China, although it's, it appears to be recovering, or its production has picked up, in practice, it's just going to release a whole lot of goods into the global economy for which there is little demand. And so the prices will fall. And that, I think, gives us a very deflationary environment. A very deflationary environment. And here's a chart that I think I would like to spend some time on. I know I'm running out of time here, but 
This is a chart that I've taken back to 1967, although you could probably take it back to the 15th or 16th century, and the same relationship would hold. It shows the ratio between non-traded goods prices, things like services, restaurant meals, haircuts, um, houses even, you can regard those as a service, relative to traded goods prices, things like consumer electronics, cars and the like. And here you can see a very familiar sine curve, the sort of economic cycle. And we've gone through a period over the last 10 years where service prices have risen. As we all know, it now costs a lot of money to, to eat in a restaurant relative to staying at home and watching the television that you can buy quite cheaply. I think in some cases now in London you can probably buy a television for less than you can go out for dinner. So you have service prices up here, manufacturing prices here. This is something that happens from time to time and always mean reverts. The question is, how does the ratio between these two prices come back to normal? Because if it doesn't, the person in manufacturing will never be able to afford to go out to dinner. The person in manufacturing will never be able to afford to live in the house in the country that they want to live in. That ultimately, either the service prices have to come down or the manufacturing goods prices come up. Now, if China is going to dump cars, if it's going to dump consumer electronics and steel and other industrial commodities into global markets, manufactured prices are just going to come down, as we saw in that previous chart. And that implies that service prices, house prices, are going to have to come down even faster, which is overwhelmingly deflationary. And for countries that are not competitive, this really is bad news. That it's not, if you're Spain or Italy or Greece, you need to actually become more competitive against the target that's moving, moving downwards. And so I think the fact that we have this deflationary outlook really does emphasize the need to come up with the next big idea, to innovate some way out of this. Because to stay with the existing industrial structure, for SEAT to try and compete with the Shanghai Motor Company is going to be impossible. But really other ideas have to come out. Now for, for many of us, we hope this will in some senses be good news because if you have a job and prices are falling, your real income is going up. But if you're unemployed, and the unemployed will of course rise quite a number that's moving away from you. And I think I'd emphasize that by looking at somewhere like Korea. Korea is one of the few countries in the world where the inventory ratio is incredibly low, where corporate profits have actually picked up, where unemployment has stopped rising. And the equity market is up, and I think justifiably so. Korea, in a sense, is one of the big success stories of the last few months. But how was Korea successful? Well, they did a little bit of investment. They've invented new flat screen TVs and things. But actually, what Korea really did was sense in the middle of 2008 that the world was going to be unfriendly. And that the best thing they could do was collapse their currency by 40% and steal everybody else's markets. And it's worked for Korea. It obviously wouldn't work for the whole world. But I think we in Europe need to recognize this as a warning. That we, because of the euro, don't have the option of collapsing our currency so that we can dispose of our inventories. That we have to come up with a better solution. We have to come up with new products and to innovate. Because this route has been closed to us by the euro. So for the countries in the euro, if the euro is going to succeed, innovation must become their number one priority. Because without that, either the euro must break up or the region must become incredibly poor through wage deflation, and that has its own political implications. So I think Korea is interesting, and it shows perhaps why Asia is good at this, but all they did was devalue their currency. And other countries are following the same suit. I, I spend a lot of time talking to Australasian central banks, and I was uh, having an informal conversation over, over the sort of required bid to do when you visit the Reserve Bank of Australia,
Um, the guy I was talking to coming over to Europe to, to do a marketing campaign for Australian government bonds or a few to sell, and they send central bank economists over to give presentations. And he said, I actually would love to go to Europe and do a presentation in favor of floating currencies because, hey, we haven't even had a recession in Australia. We just took the currency down and exported our problems to somebody else. And that's increasingly the view in the Pacific. Take your currency down, whether you're Korea, Australia, New Zealand's about to sink their currency and heavy government intervention to push the currency down to defend their dairy sector. But if Europe is not going to have currency flexibility, it, and it can't, I think, cope with deflation, then the only way the euro can survive and Europe can ever pick up is if we innovate new products and justify the level of wages that we have. Because if we don't do that in the next couple of years, then either the euro must split up or we're all going to become extremely poor. So what does this make into a global summary? I'm pressing all buttons. Well, there isn't much good news in this presentation, as you may have noticed. The US economy is part of the way through its adjustment. People are beginning to save. In the last six months, US consumers have actually reduced their mortgage debt by paying it back, not just defaulting upon it. But they've still got a long way to go. Late 2010, they've probably got to the right level of savings. By 2012, their balance sheets will be healthier. They might start to pick up 2012, 2013. But by then, the US government will be so indebted that it will probably raise taxes by the equivalent of 10% of GDP and give them another recession. Exactly what happened in Japan. Japan repaid its debts by 2005. By the time the private sector had repaid its debt, the government was bankrupt and they had to raise taxes and they, were, they beat everybody else into the recession of 2007. In Japan today, there's really nothing going on. Maybe manufacturing isn't getting any worse, but there are no signs of growth and the domestic economy is now weakening. It looks to me something like a black hole. Very difficult to see anything positive going on. In Europe, the rate of decline has probably stabilized. I don't think it's improved. But structural imbalances remain. And I think this is the biggest challenge for Europe. That other countries are devaluing their exchange rates. In the US, they're taking pay cuts. Europe is going to have to either do that or innovate some great products to justify existing wages. Because if not, then the outlook for Europe, I think, is particularly bleak. Spain, Italy, and Ireland are at the forefront of that. Ireland is undoubtedly the worst. They're looking for something like a 60% fall in house prices, 30% decline in wages to regain their competitiveness. Something that's incredibly painful, and to be honest, I don't think they'll achieve. The UK, perhaps it's a bit of a stereotype, didn't like the hangover, went back to the pub. Ultimately, a bigger hangover awaits, but I think it's next year. Some of the Asian emerging markets are looking healthier. They devalued their currencies, they've stolen some market share, they've shed their inventories, and there is some good news there. It is one of the few relatively bright spots of the global economy. China, I think, however, is going to emerge, despite its recent pickup, as a big force to global deflation, which can only serve to increase the pressure on Europe. And hiding all of this at the beginning of this rather long presentation is this little world called Wall Street that did innovate. It's the one area where we've seen huge innovation over the last six to nine months. Unfortunately, it's probably the wrong sort of innovation because it was about investment bankers getting rich again. And if there's anybody we didn't really want to get rich again, it was probably them, but they've managed it. I think I'm probably over time, so I should stop here, but thank you very much for your attention. Quizá me puede... Gracias. Muchas gracias, doctor Ant, por uh, la interesante, aunque muy preocupante, eh, presentación. En realidad, hay, un, hay otro documento que quizá, en, de alguna forma, pueden acceder, que tiene un perfil mucho más optimista y, y, y con una serie de propuestas que son interesantes. Eh, 
Es el momento de empezar con preguntas. Si alguien tiene pregunta o comentario, yo comenzaría por la eh, señora eh, Mónica Martínez Montes y después, por favor, levanten manos y, y podremos comenzar. Gracias, gracias, Hunt. Gracias, David. Eh, solo por abusar un poco de mi, de mi silla, quería preguntar dos cosas. Eh, una, hemos visto muchas debilidades preocupantes y reales, eh, pero si has hablado del sistema financiero europeo, eh, algunas verdades y algunas cifras, pero hecho de menos la fortaleza del sistema financiero español, que creo que es una de las pocas fortalezas que tiene España. Entonces, ¿eso cómo nos puede ayudar? Porque de momento pues, la cosa va francamente bien frente a países como Reino Unido o Alemania u otros. ¿no? Y el segundo hemos podido ver en cuanto a caligrafía de situación que probablemente esta crisis que muchos comparan con la, la depresión de 29 pero que poco tiene que ver porque no tiene muchos precedentes en cuanto a la, a la caligrafía de esta, de esta situación económica o financiera hemos visto que no es una W, no es una U y probablemente pues estemos en una L, pero sin duda alguna en la caligrafía china, que es una de las más antiguas de la humanidad, la, se escribe crisis significa oportunidad. Entonces me gustaría también que nos comentara qué oportunidades hay o qué usted ve en, en esta nueva situación. Thank you. A few questions. Then. Um, in terms of the European financial system, relative. In terms of the European, the health of the European financial system relative to the U.S., I think in most financial systems around the world, they're still not admitting all of the losses. We know in America, for instance, that the, the investment, the commercial banks haven't even begun to estimate what their loan books are worth. Um, in, as I mentioned in the presentation, many, much of the structured finance exposure of the Eurozone banks is still on the balance sheets at par. It hasn't been written down. And I have a concern about the Spanish banking system, in that unemployment has only just really begun to increase. We've had a lot of fiscal assistance for the economy, as you can see, as I noticed in the signs as I drove in from the airport today. Um, And of course, with people like Santander who've acquired um, property ex implied property exposure in places like the UK, which simply hasn't slowed down, I do have a feeling that the bad news may still be in the post, as they say, for many of the financials here. Um, I think when we, we have a negative output gap of 15, 20% of the economy and unemployment north of 20%, maybe we may have a different picture of, of the health of the financial system. In terms of the L and the opportunity, I believe it or not, I am something of an optimism that, that mankind will always recover optimist that mankind will always recover from things. The Reverend Malthus, who predict, who's a famous economist who predicted we'd all starve to death by 1850, um, was wrong, as I guess most economists are. I would say that if I knew what the next big idea, the next big innovation was, I probably would have retired by now on the proceeds. Unfortunately, I haven't got that much foresight. But I think the world that we will inherit or, or experience over the next five and perhaps eight, maybe even ten years, will be one in which nominal growth is minimal. But credit isn't used... To, to make up for weak incomes. And that the, the type of products that will, that will prosper in this are not something that necessarily rely on volume, but it's something you are prepared to pay for, that it's a real service or it's a real innovation um, that does set it apart. So I think that people will always buy some level of goods And that mankind, I think, will pay for something that they see some value for. But I don't think that value will be in terms of the next property development or maybe even the next mass-produced car that the Ford Focus or the Seat Ibiza or the Shanghai, whatever it's, whatever it's called, I, I can't remember at the moment, um, that making money in those commodity-style goods will be extremely difficult. 
but providing some form of service or some particular good that has a very high value added will still make people money. Um, that there will be profits in that for companies, there will be employment for people. Um, but the one place not to be in this environment is something that relies on credit, such as property and property development, or something that faces a lot of competition from, from Asia, such as, as I say, the low end of the manufacturing spectrum. That the challenge for Europe is to, um, in some senses, emulate what the US did. And I, there's always a story that sticks into my mind that, that makes me quite positive and negative for Europe and positive for the United States. The inventor of the iPod was an academic from the northern part of the UK who travelled around the UK trying to sell the idea of the iPod to various venture capitalists and companies around the UK and was told that it was a silly idea. And one rather famous entrepreneur called Alan Sugar in the UK said it would be dead within six months if he tried to make it. Um, so he went to California and sold it to, um, to Apple, and the rest, as they say, is history. The U.S. had the marketing ability, it had the venture capital, um, and, and maybe even just the ambition to make the iPod into something that was a world beater. I think that, that Europe is going to have to do something similar. At the end of the day, the iPod is just a disk drive with, a, with, some, with some cool marketing. Um, we need to come up with some of that cool marketing. China can sell us the disk drive, uh, but we need to provide some of that value added. Um, and that's where I think that the, the returns were made, is in, and it's partly in creating perceptions, but partly in creating something that, that people want that has a profit margin. And I say, I don't think it will be in the old model of just build another housing development, and it won't be in the 19th century model of mass-produced manufacturers. Quisiera hacer un comentario y, y escuchar tu opinión sobre este. O sea, eh, has presentado una crisis que es sustancialmente y principalmente financiera, aunque has tocado también el tema de la producción en China. O sea, mi interpretación es que la crisis financiera se ha desatado porque la gente no, había, no ha sido capaz, primero en Estados Unidos, después en Gran Bretaña, después en Europa, de pagar su mortgage. Pero esto ha sucedido porque la gente ya no tenía dinero. Y la causa de esto es porque buena parte de la producción se ha trasladado a otro sitio. Y, de nuevo, estamos hablando de China, India. Y mi impresión es que es un proceso que acaba de empezar. No es un proceso ya maduro. O sea, en China hay 200 millones de personas que están produciendo, pero hay un billón de personas que no están produciendo todavía. Y llegarán a producir. Y en India hay otros tantos. Entonces, mi, mi perspectiva preocupante es que nosotros podríamos tener una crisis no por tres años o cuatro años, sino por diez o quince o veinte años. Ahora, esto obviamente muy preocupante, por lo menos desde mi eh, punto de vista, pero creo que nos debe eh, lanzar, echar a, una, a, a un trabajo intenso, un trabajo que no puede ser exclusivamente a nivel de empresas individuales. Parece muy interesante esa propuesta tuya de que las empresas busquen innovar, y esa seguramente es una clave. Pero ¿es suficiente esto? ¿Es el mercado capaz automáticamente de ajustar los desequilibrios? ¿O se requiere también un esfuerzo razonado, eh, colaborativo, conjunto de una serie de países? Diría, la crisis global de todos los países del mundo. Entonces, se me viene a la cabeza un organismo que surgió hace 10, 15 años, la Organización Mundial del Comercio, que tenía propio esta función entre sus objetivos. Y estábamos hablando de esto antes y tú me decías, justamente, no, has, no ha cumplido. La Organización Mundial del Comercio no ha cumplido. Sin embargo, yo creo que es necesario pensar en, una orga, en un organismo internacional, supranacional, porque las soluciones nacionales de Estados Unidos o de algunos países europeos no van a funcionar para el todo, porque la crisis y la, y la dinámica son globales. Entonces, quizá un G20, un G20, como estabas mencionando tú antes, una instancia que se preocupe por encontrar los mecanismos, en inglés se, se utiliza la palabra de fine-tuning, de eh, regulación 
eh, fina de, de los diferentes aspectos que están en el juego para que eh, los cambios no sean dramáticos, no, no produzcan efecto desastroso en algunos casos y muy eh, eh, positivo en otros casos. ¿Hay esta posibilidad? ¿Cómo, ¿Cómo lo ves tú? ¿Hay una institución que puede eh, efectivamente jugar este rol o no es necesario y el mercado puede, puede equilibrar eh, la fuerza de demanda y oferta? Ok, I think, uh, two comments. The first uh, was something you said quite early on, um, that jobs had moved to China and India and the like and therefore people didn't have any money to pay back their mortgages. Uh, I would suggest that if they bought a cheaper house, they probably wouldn't have such a big mortgage. Um, that people aged 25 in the UK with no discernible income buying quarter of a million pound houses possibly um, had quite a lot to do with the financial difficulties that they'll ultimately face. And the same true in the US, that people were buying houses that were very expensive relative to their level of income, so maybe they should perhaps just have adjusted their lifestyles. Um, but anyway, en enough of that puritanical preaching. Uh, in terms of international organizations, I think the G20 is a particularly good forum, potentially. Um, that it could prevent China using export subsidies. It could have persuaded China to have spent its money not on telling companies to produce things for which there was no demand, but telling China to give people some form of social security safety net so that the savings rate could come down in China. China would therefore consume more and would have actually been a locomotive for global demand rather than a producer of inventories. The problem with the G20, as it is constituted at the moment, is that most of the, pe most of the people in the room making the decisions are doing so on probably a 24-month time horizon, i.e. between now and the next general election. The bailout of Eastern Europe was successful in the short term, disastrous in the long term, But given it was proposed by Gordon Brown and he's unlikely to be in power in 12 months' time, I guess he didn't have to worry about the consequences. It just wouldn't go bang while he was in power. Uh, and I think that's one of the problems with the G20 is that it's staffed by politicians who simply need to stabilize the situation until the next election. In Spain, we obviously have a lot of fiscal spending, a rising budget deficit, and that's providing some support to the construction sector, to the labor market, but it's not doing anything to pro improve the structural imbalances that I talked about, um, because they will take years to, to resolve, and whoever gets the benefits is unlikely to be the person in power. One of the intriguing things about the UK's economic history, the benefits, and believe it or not, there were some benefits from having Margaret Thatcher as Prime Minister. Unfortunately, most of them turned up when Tony Blair was Prime Minister, which um, might have been personally satisfying for Thatcher, but not very good for, for, for the politicians that wanted to remain in power. And I think that's the problem with the G20, that it's driven still by some ideological standpoints, particularly from Obama and Brown, but mainly just it's working on a different time horizon um, to what we, as members of the global economy, would probably like and what would be optimal. So I'd like to see the same countries turn up to the G20, but I'd rather they didn't invite the politicians. Maybe it was just the bureaucrats, the, the central bank governors, and other people with sufficiently long tenure to want to take a five to ten year view that the UK government wouldn't be presiding over another trip to the pub to keep economic growth going until Gordon Brown can have a general election, and, and which he's unlikely to win, but at least he might get some speaking engagements if he doesn't lose too badly. Um, and I think you know, that that, that longer-term policy-making needs to be considered in any G20 type forum. The, w, the, the World Trade Organization, I think, has failed. China has basically ignored it using export subsidies and nobody's done anything about that. So that, that to me, is a failed institution. The IMF and the World Bank obviously can be very useful in resolving crises once they arrive, as Iceland and Latvia and, and Hungary are, are showing. 
But I think they're institutions that are actually running out of resources, not so much money as people. Um, the IMF and the World Bank lost a lot of people during the credit boom. They went, all their economists went off to work for investment banks. Um, I guess some of them will be coming back. But those institutions are probably at capacity now. So by default, I think the G20 is the right organization. We probably need to depoliticize it, and that, of course, will be very difficult. Thanks. ¿Alguna pregunta más? Bueno, si no hay más preguntas, si hay una. Sí, sí, creo. Sí, buenas tardes. Sí, buenas tardes. Eh, el escenario que ha, que ha planteado es un escenario de, digamos, de deflación agudizada quizás por, el, por el, la exportación de una deflación eh, procedente de China por esa acumulación de, de, de stocks, ¿no? de inventarios. Eh, eh, no obstante, hace bien poco la situación era la contraria. China exportaba inflación. Eh, eh, con lo cual al final eh, estamos en una situación como de mucha incertidumbre y como de vaivenes muy fuertes ¿no? e incluso hay economistas que hablan de un problema de, de hiperinflación o de inflación también debido a, a la cantidad de dinero que se está inyectando en el sistema para eh, reanimar la economía ¿no? que en algún momento dado cuando los activos de los bancos etcétera, pues se vayan eh, saneando ese dinero al final los bancos lo tendrán que dar salida para, porque su negocio es sacar dinero con ese dinero que tienen ¿no? entonces eh, eh, de qué modo al final eh, se puede pasar de un escenario rápidamente igual de deflación a otro de, de, de inflación I think and this is something that I suspect will affect you as, as well as myself in the United Kingdom we could in a year or two see deflation in factory goods prices um, as we try to compete with China. But maybe some inflation in the shops as governments impose higher sales taxes. Um, so I don't think there will be many governments rushing to issue index-linked bonds, um, given that they'll probably be adding 200 basis points to our inflation rates through, through higher sales taxes. Can China become inflationary? I think that the, the, can we have underlying inflation in the global economy? I think it does depend on, on whether China chooses to raise or reduce its export prices. And certainly China was an inflationary influence in 2007, and that had a great, that was a great impact on, on the, the formation of the crisis. Um, and I think the reason China had that, that inflationary bias was the, the shortage of food and the wage inflation that resulted from that. Um, and ultimately, China could return to that situation. But I think for the next couple of years, the, 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 the sheer scale of the accumulation of inventories um, will dominate. But in a couple of years' time, we could well see China maybe becoming inflationary. Although I think even then, we might find that China adopts a soft currency uh, and in a way becomes a bit like an industrial economy in the 1970s, becoming less competitive through inflation, so devaluing its currency every so often. So even then, I, I'm not convinced that China becomes inflationary. It, may, it might become inflationary for itself, but not for the global economy. Um, I think in, in many ways I'd go back to that chart that I showed, uh, and maybe I can, can steer back there. The outlook for inflation versus deflation to me is whether traded goods prices rise or non-traded goods prices come down. And I think that's been economic history for the last 300 years. In the 1970s, high service prices were corrected by rising manufactured prices, and we had the inflation of the 70s. Um, then we had deflation in the, in, the, in the 1990s, and this time I think it'll tend to be deflationary as well. Um, that, that situation could change if we were to have high manufactured goods prices, but I, but I don't see that. In terms of could we have a monetary inflation, a sort of Milton Friedman event, well, I always fall back on some arithmetic from Japan. 
When the Bank of Japan injected all that money into the Japanese financial system and they monetized the budget deficit, something some people call printing money, it raised Japan's money supply by 30%, which you could have expected to have been inflationary, except all of the debt repayment in the Japanese Zytec funds, in the corporate sector and in the household sector destroyed a third of Japan's money supply. And in, in some senses, you can say that the, bank, the, the central banks give the banks money, and the banks are just using that money to deleverage. I used an example of one of the big U.S. commercial banks. My friend Jeff had that $170 billion portfolio that's now $40 billion. Well, the Federal Reserve and the U.S. government have lent his bank about $100 billion one way and another, and that funded the write-off. So although there was an injection into the banks, it didn't improve the availability of credit in, in the real economy or provide more money to people in the street who could spend it. Now, if the Federal Reserve keeps providing that much money, ultimately there won't be enough write-offs and you could see the amount of money rise in the economy. But I think that assumes two things. One, that we get to that point sometime soon, and that the Federal Reserve is stupid enough to keep going at that point. And I think there are two assumptions there that at this stage it's quite difficult to justify. They are, they are potential events, but I don't think they're plausible. It involves an end to deleveraging and then the Federal Reserve making a mistake. So you have to take two steps, I think, to get to a monetary inflation. And you know, maybe if, um, if the, if the organisers are brave enough to invite me back in five years' time, we can, we can discuss whether, whether they're making that mistake. But given how pessimistic this presentation is, they might prefer you sit in the sun. <laughs> Más preguntas. Bueno, una más, si es breve. Sí, bu buenas noches. Eh, mi pregunta era: eh, se ha referido varias veces al, al fenómeno del iPod y cómo en, en el Reino Unido fue, digamos, eh, descartado y hizo falta. Eh, que fuese Estados Unidos donde había se juntaba la disponibilidad de, de visionarios de gente que, que tenía de posibilidad de, de saber eh, hacer marketing de este producto y también el, el Venture Capital ¿no? eh, todo esto parece que es requisito indispensable para que Europa y especialmente España pueda salir de la crisis en un periodo de tiempo relativamente corto sin asumir un, una reducción importante de, de los costes laborales. Eh, pero todo esto es algo que aparentemente requiere un periodo muy largo de, de creación. Es decir, que lugares como Silicon Valley eh, han tenido un desarrollo muy lento. Es decir, han, han creado grandes empresas, pero no ha sido una cosa que se haya producido un día para otro, sino que ha, ha surgido a lo largo de 20, 30 años. ¿Se puede esperar realistamente que que haya en, en Europa una, un cambio tan importante de, de mentalidad y especialmente en España donde eh, hace poco en algunas estadísticas salía que la mitad de, la, de las personas que estaban en la universidad eh, tenían como objetivo al terminar convertirse en funcionarios. I think the UK is familiar with that problem as well. Um... And I find it very difficult to do anything other than agree with you that it will be incredibly difficult. Um, but let's not get too pessimistic. <laughs> um, there is a way of shortcutting the process. I, I have several clients in Silicon Valley and around about the Seattle area. And other than the amount of money they've lost in the stock market, most of their concerns center on the outlook for U.S. taxes, particularly global taxation, um, and various security issues. In fact, I even met somebody that is now designing uh, firewalls that even the CIA can't breach. Um, and I think if you were to set... And, and Ireland made some progress in this, but then I think went wrong. But if you could provide a, a low tax environment with a good infrastructure in somewhere where there is obviously the rule of law and everything seems you know, relatively safe, 
then there's nothing wrong with importing entrepreneurs. It's worked for Hong Kong for 150 years, it's in many sense, and really works for the United States. Um, it's a bit like a competitive devaluation, but you no know, competitive tax cuts or tax holidays for five years for somebody to bring a startup, um, and then changing the the labour regulations so that you have a more flexible labour market for new employees, maybe not for existing ones. That would be too difficult to achieve. Um, so you can shortcut that that process. But the bottom line is it's extremely difficult to replicate something that's been a generation being formed. One of my experiences in Japan was that the one thing the Bank of Japan failed to do, and I know people always blame the Bank of Japan for Japan's crisis. In some senses that's true. But the sense I think it's true, or the big mistake, was they stopped the Japanese financial system working for anybody. Now, they might want to stop the property developers and some of the excesses, but they also destroyed the nascent venture capital industry that was starting up in Japan. And that was a huge mistake that undoubtedly made the recovery harder. It's not to say Japan could have recovered instantly had they not done that, but it certainly didn't help. Um, and I think that Europe maybe does need to, to perhaps import some Americans or some American ideas. Maybe we could leave the investment bankers at home, though. As of course, if they don't become civil servants, they become investment bankers, which is not always that productive. Bueno, yeah. muchísimas gracias, uh, Dr. Hunt, para esta interesante, detallada, a veces preocupante, pero siempre muy interesante presentación. Muchas gracias también, Mónica, eh, para apoyarnos con la Fundación para la Innovación Bank Inter en organizar esta serie de interesantes presentaciones. Y muchas gracias también a ustedes por participar, por preguntar, por asistir. Muchas gracias. Thank you.